Welcome to You Talking with Greg. I'm happy to introduce Ethan Kobayashi Sia, um, who is here to talk with me about some of the most fascinating ideas I've encountered. Uh, we've been hanging out for a little while. I saw him on John Verveke doing voices. And I was like, man, that guy's, uh, you know, actually he referenced my work, which always, of course, is something I pay attention to. Um, but then he embodied it in a particular kind of way, had fascinating bridges between John and performance. Then we hooked up, had a lovely set of conversations. I am happy to say that he's going to be joining us for the Consilience Conference, which only is tomorrow and then the next day. Uh, Ethan, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Greg. It's always, always nice to chat with a colleague that has turned friend. Um, yeah, and yeah, to be fair, like the work that uh, I referenced on Voices of Aveki is well worth referencing. And I have to give you absolute due credit for actually offering a really powerful like framework from which I can sit in the work that I do. Because I spent so long trying to figure out like, what is this thing that I'm trying to do? And, you know, a lot of the literature... Um, in the field that I work, which is the performing arts, uh, didn't really give that kind of like scientific rigor, which I really needed um, to feel a sense of security that, okay, I can, I can actually like guide somebody in this crazy thing that we're trying to do that is called performance. Well, this is, this is what's uh, so endearing uh, to me. It's so exciting. Uh, of course, we have this Consilience Conference coming up, and we were just joking before uh, the program that I was actually had to read up on this and ask what it was. Now, actually, I was very shaped by this book, Consilience. Um, it is the jumping together of theory and facts to afford a, co a coherent vision. Uh, and it's really fundamentally a coherent vision, at least if we build off of E.O. Wilson, of the natural sciences into the social sciences and humanities. And it is then that gives rise to a unified learning that is so profoundly different than the chaotic, fragmented pluralism. Uh, and I think that's a beautiful vision. Many people do. I think E.O. Wilson's consilience fails um, for a whole host of reasons, but he grabs pieces of it. Um, and what, uh, what I think is happening now is filling in some of the missed pieces that E.O. Wilson was missing. And what the litmus test of that fundamentally uh, Ethan, from my vantage point, is to mm. what extent does it then manifest in the humanities? Okay, so mm. ultimately, the question is, if we have unified learning, the, the creative expression of the humanities will be in right resonance with what the natural and social sciences are saying, and, back, and vice versa, to create a constructive opponent dialectic, and man, do you embody that, and that is super, super cool. Uh, first of all, very, very flattered to, to hear that. I like, I like, I have like bubbling sensations over here. Um, but I think that that's a very pertinent question at the same time. Like, how does it manifest? And, you know, something that I've been really thinking about, I think I've brought it up to you in an email as well, which is like creativity seems to be the, the conscious application of what would be bad behavioral investments for the possibility of like long-term higher uh -huh. order beneficial gains right. um, for humanity. Of course, you know, there is a certain extent to which that can manifest itself. Sometimes it's within the community. Sometimes it's just within the confines of a rehearsal room. But at least for me, where something really becomes artistic is where it speaks to something much more perennial. Mm -hmm. And so I think quite naturally, um, there is this sense of, as an actor trainer, I'll just speak for my domain of expertise. It's like, I also don't want people to feel too safe within a working context. There has to be an element of risk that bad investment has to be there. Uh -huh. But at the same time, the procedural enactment of making these bad investments has to mitigate like destructive processes that would, you know, undermine the entire system. Mm -hmm. And that calls into question like what performance is wow. necessarily. Beautiful. Be <laughs> hey, we'll definitely get into that. I love creative models, variation, selection, retention kinds of models. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but before we do, hey, tell us a little bit about where you came from and what brought you into this space. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, how, fa how far back do you want to go, you know? Um, hey, man, it's a fascinating story. You tell, you, you take us on a little ride and we'll, and we'll you know, circle back here. But yeah, bring us back to the creative trajectory that found, <laughs> that landed sure. you here. 
Sure. Uh, I'm an open book. It's all written in Latin, but the reviews are good though. <laughs> so uh, actually it started for me, you know, only recently I came to this uh, revelation um, around the start of this year that kind of my whole work began from a place of trauma. And so I grew up in a very uh, traumatic household. I was very um, consistently uh, physically and emotionally abused mm. as a child. And I was sitting back and like trying to write this stuff out. And uh, one of the things that really struck me was uh, inspired by this question that um, Jung had done in one of his last interviews, mm -hmm. where the interviewer asked him, when was the first time you recognize yourself as a conscious being, mm -hmm. you know, and he described it as like he was just walking and then suddenly the, the fog parted. It was like yep. things were clear. You know, it's a really wonderful like image. Uh, I had none of that. So what happened to me <laughs> was I was, you know, getting into these routine fights uh, with my mom and I was about like five years old or something. Mm. And so she'd be beating the crap out of me and I'd be cowering underneath like a table. Wow. And then uh, she would get to the point where my dad, who was like separated from us at the time, or mm -hmm. maybe it was my uncle whatsoever, had to come in and mediate the situation. Mm -hmm. And she would point to me mm -hmm. and say like, ah, you see, he's crying. That's not real. That's fake. You know? And so it was really interesting to have this observer effect be imposed. Right. And so me as a kid, right, I sit down there and, and I do the, the sighing thing, you know, that kids do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Sure. And go, oh, I can actually sort of regulate this, sort of downregulate that. But is it really real? Like all of this stuff, I'm still right. feeling it, you know? Wow. So... Yeah, talk about being like out of body. Totally. Well, you know, so there you are, a little primate under the table, you know, and I got a persona and then you got a receiver and then you're trying to figure out what the hell's real. Holy shit. Yeah. Right. Well, that's the thing, right? Like she would look at that and then mm -hmm. she would, she would see me down regulating and she would see, ah, you see, he can stop it at will, you know? So sure. that's the kind of confirmation of me having some sort of agency around my affect. Yep. And the way that that had, manifested itself as I grew up was I would do this thing where I watch TV mm -hmm. and I would watch the same episodes. Mm -hmm. Can I just pause just a again. second? Because this yeah. is actually um, this is kind of profound. Okay. Mm -hmm. In my estimation. All right. Because mm -hmm. at least if we just take a quick you talk lens. Okay. And the quick you talk lens is the virtue of our propositional speech, question, answer, dialogues, and claims gives rise to the question of justification. Justification mm -hmm. is what is the propositional legitimizing structure of reality and what's just imagination, whatever, what isn't, okay? And this is the con human condition. And, mm -hmm. and so you're just pointing to a five-year-old's unbelievable, you know, powerful encounter in a very emotionally charged way, but an unbelievably powerful encounter of the justification space, the public-private space, and the embodied reality. And, and what is the inner relationship between that is an unbelievably bizarre and embodied mm -hmm. reality. And when you encounter it, so for Jung, he's on a road and he's like, I realize that I am myself. He's higher, he's farther along and safer in relation, right? And what yeah. he's able to do is, and then with a sense of agency, although Jung, you know, goes on a pretty big journey, but in that moment, very agentic for him uh mm -hmm. in relation john horgan uh, a consciousness guy uh, actually reports a very similar experience although it freaked the hell out of him when he was like 10 he was like oh my god i'm myself i'm myself ah! <laughs> and he had a little panic attack um yeah. in relation but but these are just wonderful stories of you know of the person i primate me relational justificatory embodied context and the mystery of mm -hmm. that and the weirdness of that and i just want you know Obviously, they do, with all, all due respect, there's a little microcosm of the human condition right there. Thanks for that. Like, because it, it really helps to recognize that, oh, okay, there's something, there's a kind of common denominator at work here, right? And that's immensely healing, satisfying, comforting, um, securing. But what 
I want to add to that is the way that something like fantasy or the speculative idea starts to get brought in. Because um, what transpired after that was I would watch like Saturday morning cartoons and I would watch the same cartoon over and over again, you know, and I would learn the scripts by rote, uh, including accents, including intonation and all that stuff. Mm. And so what ended up happening was I would start to recognize that that was changing the way I looked at the world. So a, a very big uh, influence on me when I was younger um, were you know, these improv heavy comedians. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Robin Williams was a very, very big childhood hero of mm. mine. And watching him do Genie is like the most amazing thing for a five, six-year-old, seven-year-old mm. to, to watch. Mm -hmm. Because what he had done, and I'm not sure if people really necessarily pick up on this consciously, but if you watch Aladdin, like the very first um, um, animated uh, Aladdin, mm -hmm. he makes what I call transtextual references. Okay. So he breaks the fourth wall without necessarily like looking through the screen in the way that we're used to now. Right. You know, right. he makes references to like Nixon mm. in an in an improv while he's voice acting. Mm. You know, and there's something really powerful about that which breaks through the wall of the fantasy and connects us into the real world in, at a reference point that we kind of all can understand yes. on multiple levels, even though kids would recognize it very differently. Totally. Now, I then started to begin monitoring my own cognition. So I remember around like nine or 10, I, I became very aware of the fact that whenever I spoke to somebody uh, who was Caucasian, mm -hmm. um, I would have an American accent. Huh. Like it would just emerge wow. as a form of like, very organic desire for coherence. And mm -hmm. I was like, why is that? Mm -hmm. Why the fuck is that happening? Mm -hmm. And I can't seem to stop it. This was mm -hmm. the thing. I became very aware of how involuntary it was. Wow. Um, and I beat myself up for it for a mm -hmm. long time, all the wow. way until I was like 16, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from a you talk lens, it's like mm -hmm. there's this, there's a certain pattern of like fixed activity mm -hmm. which moves itself in a social environment totally. that then becomes made aware, well, the, the mind is made aware of it, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. On a private level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it develops an attitude towards that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, okay. Maybe I can make some money off of this. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, uh, hey, that's the American way. You're really doing that. <laughs> hey, maybe that's what the accent afforded me. I was like, I was capitalist till I was 15. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, but then, you know, it, it very quickly became something where like, I was thrown into auditions as a child actor, you know, and, and being... Yeah, let, well, be actually, can, let's just pause on the yeah. Utah lens here. Yeah, just a sec. That. Okay, so everybody, you know, if you're familiar with Utah, you know, the core model of human consciousness, the ESPA model, you have awareness, and then the core structure of the self, you have your primate self, uh, that down into your mammal, animal organism, and the, man, the primate self met regulating via the influence matrix is constantly doing self-other recursive relevance, okay? And it's looking for harmony and mutual relational value to the extent that it can find it. Um, so it does want to do in-grouping first. Uh, it will do out-grouping if need be, and if there's a threat and there's some justification, but it wants to try to harmonize um, and bring into relevance. And then you have your self-conscious system that really, by the time you're an adolescent is really online. If you're precocious, it starts coming online. Then that is the explicit want self-awareness that I'm presenting myself a particular way. I'm feeling a particular way. I'm acting a particular way. And I can now observe all of that interrelation. And there's a filtering shit that's going on. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. And you become aware. And then you're like, well, wait a minute, what should I be doing? What's right? Why am I doing what I'm doing? This is the great adolescent identity uh, moment of self-concept where you're like, oh my God. So what you're seeing there, especially as a super precocious, bright, you know, traumatized kid who also has this capacity to observe what's actually going on and ask these deep questions about like, why? Why is this okay? What am I doing? Uh, so you're really thrown into this ego self persona 
network. Uh, and, and, you know, my argument is we don't give kids or, or adults really a good frame uh, for understanding a matrix that they find themselves in. And that might be a good idea as we enter into this uh, chaotic world of the 21st century. But I just want to highlight, you know, as you navigate that, we can point to the basic architecture of, of the position we find ourselves and understand when you get the self-conscious awareness perspective, why is it such a weird thing? Well, it's also it's also really weird because it's like then I as you were talking just then, it's like I had to figure out this matrix on my own through trial and error. Mm -hmm. And it very quickly became in my teen years, um actually a big the big insight that I gleaned from you just speaking is that like I feel that that manner of attempting to find coherence with a larger world that wasn't going to traumatize me. Mm -hmm. um, actually further alienated me from my mom, you know, which mm -hmm. then makes me more other than I was uh, right. even when I was five. So then what started to happen was that I got bullied for it because I sounded so different, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that means mm -hmm. that on the peer level, that coherence was starting to face diminishing returns. Yep. And that's really bizarre to me to think about because it's like, Okay, if it's not working at home and it's not working uh, in a peer group outside of home, then very quickly that behavior starts to get extinguished. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. So what ended up uh, feeling like the right path, it, it was almost as if that particular behavior needed to maintain its own legitimacy mm -hmm. in my system. Mm -hmm. And perhaps serendipitously, it found itself uh, in a kind of more industrial infrastructural mm -hmm. model. And that's yep. when it started really acting right. um, as a profession. Mm. You know? And that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I went through the whole path, went to drama school um, in London and all that sort of thing. And then something really bizarre started to happen. Mm. It started to feel like the infrastructure that existed wasn't quite in coherence with what this behavior was seeking to fulfill. Mm. Okay. So I'd like to tell this story. It was very, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure you, I'm sure you'll have things to say about this. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but when I was in drama school, uh, we were being taught something called the Michael Chekhov method. Um, okay. It's a really wonderful psychophysical uh, methodology. And I remember first class i went to this class and i went to ask my uh, teacher i'm a nerd so i read like tons of books before i even started right and i had gone to her and i gone you know hey you know i'm really excited to learn from you um i'm really excited to finally get into this because i've been reading uh, quite a lot about it so you know I'm, I'm super excited to get like my foot in the door um and learn this thing properly and she went yeah, none of that stuff is the real stuff. What I'm mm. teaching you here is the thing. Mm. And I went, huh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right then. <laughs> so we proceed to run around the room for two hours. Mm -hmm. And like, by the end of that, you know, everybody's bloody exhausted. Okay. You know, um, the prefrontal cortex is now downregulated. Mm -hmm. Everybody's in a hyper, in a hyper auto suggestible state. And then she kind of gathers everybody into a circle. And she goes, okay, so um, now, what's your bloody Irish um, accent, really wonderful, stuck in my brain. But she goes like, all right, so we're now going to enter into the circle, and I want you to say your name and declare, I'm an actor. Huh. Right. And I went, ha, ha, ha. So something really interesting here, a call back to five years old, I had a split in my, in my cognition. Mm -hmm. Because on one hand, I recognized that, okay, I could do this, mm -hmm. right? And there was this other part of me that's going like, maybe not, man. Mm. Something feels off about this. But all around me, this is the group, the, mm -hmm. the kind of like group social justification, collective yep. identity creation thing. I see like, you know, he's like 18 year old white girls stepping into the circle going like, oh, this is my dream. Oh, I, I want to, I'm an actor. And so it came around to me mm. and I immediately went quite again involuntarily um yeah my name is ether and i'm an actor and i could cry i could have that same kind of like affect and all the time there's this like other part of my brain going like are you sure mate 
And this is something that we now call the bullshit light. Mm -hmm. You know, in our in the TMS system, right? You try and identify what the bullshit light is. Where is this polarity between the calm MO flashlight and this kind of like um, yep. a neurotic self-running mechanism mm -hmm. that's happening? Sorry. But I had to point this particular part of the story out. This feels like a nice linear through line. Mm -hmm. I had to point out this particular part of the story because that for me is monumental as the exclusion of an identity outside of this particular infrastructural institutional frame. Yeah. And it's bizarre to consider because the actor has to engage with life engage with a diversity of identities mm -hmm. in order to develop a fluency to move between them. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah, no, it's an unbelievably fascinating thing. And this is why I'm so, I've uh, been so enriched talking to you because I never, um, you know, my, my frame as a clinical mm -hmm. psychologist um, is watching people come to me. And basically often it is this sort of bullshit wonderer voice uh, that I initially get contact with uh, in the sense that, hey, what brings you in, okay? There's this, some reflective concern that something's wrong, okay? There's this, there's like, I don't know. And there is this felt sense that I am like pushed into particular roles. I have particular feelings, okay? I, I know my identity isn't quite right in relation. I don't know how, what I'm doing at all. I want it to go away, okay? the, mm -hmm. the discomfort feelings and distress, um, but I don't know what's real. And somehow I, you know, I, what is real? What ought I do? And I'm stuck. Okay. Um, and so as an actor, you are then systematically placed in roles that were intuitively placed in only you're systematically then dropped in that at a level of potential self-consciousness, right? Yeah. That opens up all sorts of different kind of dynamics between the implicit roles that we are asked to be as part of, oh, you're going to be a student, you're going to be a girlfriend, you're going to be this, right? Mm -hmm. To the then actor role and the, then the self-conscious awareness of what that actually means. What does it do to yeah. the system when we're going to drop into the imaginative, imaginal play domain, okay? Mm. And then see this and then play what are we doing? Um, and I think what you're also saying, what I'm hearing in the story that you're telling is you're also at this stage in the game, you're also like, okay, what's real and what's bullshit? Yeah. Right? Fundamentally, you know, and, and I, 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 and that's what really the link is because that's the existential, uh, an aspect of the analytic existential crisis that people bring in in the meaning crisis is they they really they then they, the confusion and the role switching and the angst and especially if you're carrying the neurotic burden of anxiety and depression and past trauma it all just can feel so both confusing and meaningless because yeah. it just seems that we're just flipping back and forth between various roles and there's no framework uh, uh, to make sense out of all that. So I'm just listening to that. And then this whole idea of why the hell do we create theater? <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. That's the perennial question, isn't it? Because it's like, why do we create theater? Well, let's dial it back a little bit. Like what is performance at all? You okay. know, and this was the question that I posed in my, in my master's thesis to try and offer at least a technical definition of performance independent of whether it's an art form whatsoever. I'm, I think at this point, one of our first conversations, I already said that like performance is one of the most cognitively complex art forms, not better, not worse. It's just fucking complex because it involves the voluntary construction and inhabitation of some kind of salience landscape, some identity that's independent of a good life. Because fundamentally, the thing that is most dramatic and, and amazing to watch is the tragedy of suboptimal uh, uh, alignment with reality. Totally. It's why we have the hubristic myth. Right. It's why things are dramatic and why Chekhov is just like a ton of people in an in absolute mess. You know, we want to see that. And I think a part of where that extends into the existential domain that might benefit humanity is that when we watch a, literally an ontological representation of suboptimal processing, 
we are offered an opportunity, I think collectively, to project into it, right? Apply that same fictional framing to certain reference points in our own lives that we can go, well, maybe I shouldn't be like Hamlet as much. Totally. It feels a little bit too close to home yep. for me there. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> and that's the process of catharsis, right? It's like, ah, good. Greg can inhabit that and he can feel the thing that uh, I'm mm. feeling, so I don't have to feel it. And I can just work on the higher order stuff. Right. <laughs> Right. I mean, this whole, it, it opens up this landscape. It opens up this better, it opens up this opportunity for learning and reflection. Um, I'm also, I'm also struck um, by the state of our artistic entertainment today, at least the entertainment world. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit struck by, I'll, I'm just going to Seinfeld actually. Okay. <laughs> Uh, right now <laughs> and 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 with and while i love seinfeld i grew up with seinfeld that was unbelievably yeah. hysterical okay and it did it pulled us into this sort of like you know um th this story this way of being but it meta communicates meaninglessness in many ways okay yes you know in a way that then at for our time at one level is hysterical and and entertaining if you're in a place to kind of see it and reflect back but I'm also now in the context of the meaning crisis in the context of what theater and art may really, what we really need in relation. Mm. It's like, oh my God, you know, that's, a, that is definitely a symptom, you know, mm. and we're seeing in my estimation, a symptom of the chaotic fragmented pluralism in our entertainment. Um, and, and what, and what some of the great literature then is obviously doing, it's pulling the archetype across cultural contexts, right? Uh, from the multiplicity of different potential perspectives that humans tend to inhabit. And then will enable us to see cross-cultural con contexts of the tragedy of particular kinds of structures. And then we recognize those, we take a Jungian angle, we recognize those patterns within us, and then we can learn to in habit those patterns, we can learn to reflect on those patterns, we can learn to steer away from the patterns or try to, and we can then collectively potentially come together around those patterns and inhabit them in a hopefully constructive opponent process. Although that's mm. where I was like, mm, I don't know, <laughs> you know, where is that uh, in relationship to the current state of affairs? And there's a lot of parasitic entertaining processes yeah. that are just sucking you in and giving you no real refinement around it. They're just grabbing your attention and dropping you in what would potentially be really a disastrous mode of being. And they're mm. not structured to actually learn from it. They're just structured to grab your attention and put you in it, especially for teenage girls. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's particularly prevalent today because the idea here is that everybody has a has a cell phone camera, everybody has access to TikTok and Instagram. And so to a certain extent, performance has become part of the mediums of our communication, which also means that it, we can do something now which we weren't able to do um, probably about 50 years ago, mm -hmm. which is that if there was going to be some interaction Mm -hmm. with like, say, you know, uh, a, a very enthusiastic dog has mm -hmm. come up and is, you know, licking your face. A thought that now occurs quite consistently is, oh, honey, take a picture of this moment, right? right? That, that observer eye is now much more accessible okay. to us. Absolutely. But you see, you brought up the word parasitic, mm -hmm. um, which for me is a big part of the, of the whole performance proposal, is that without having knowledge of our own epistemology and how it is related into the world, how incoherent we are or how incoherent we are uh -huh. <laughs> with the world, uh -huh. you know, it can very easily organize itself into reinforcing those particular processes, totally. especially when they are going to be supported by likes and followers and monetary gain and social status. And the influence matrix is very clear on this, right? So all of those things can become um, privately justified as let's keep this parasitic thing going. Yep. And then ooh, maybe we end up, I mean, hopefully not, but maybe we end up alienating ourselves from what is actually much more optimal for gaining a kind of coherence in the world. Totally. Does that land with you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the whole argument is that the, um, the per instrumental persona attention gathering landscape 
is what the social media structures, okay? Instrumental potential you know, persona landscaping, which means basically I'm going to remember what you said when you were like, Hey, when I was with Caucasian, I started talking automatically that, that mm. right. Mm. And what that basically means is you're going to try to find influential resonance with an in-group and you're going to try to operate in a way that maximizes your reward. Okay. But in, when you're doing it on instrumental, that's called social influence. That means, Hey, I can be part of the in-group and then I can gain influence and in relationship to that. And I'm doing it essentially as an instrumental exchange. Okay. All right. But what's crucial about what the, what the matrix says is the matrix says you're, well, you want to track what you can influence, but you also want to track your unique ideographic particular. Okay. You want to be seen, known and valued for the core that is you mm -hmm. or else you're a transferable fungible instrument. Okay. Which means that if you stop doing the thing, like if all of a sudden, then though you'll be replaced. Okay. Yeah. So essentially what this means is that you set yourself up for audience capture. Okay. Yes. Which basically means I'm going to be a persona to fill an instrumental role, to be loved in a particular way, not that for what I am, but for what I do and what other people can then do better than you, they'll just be replaced. And if you stop doing this thing, you will be, it's exactly the conditional love of Carl Rogers. It's like, I'll yeah. love you for what you are able to do for me. And not for the essence of your organismic valuing process and the uniqueness of yourself. And so we are now splitting mm -hmm. the relational value, social influence dynamic, and we are pouring all the instrumental capacity of, of relational value, so of social influence. So what this means is this. If you fail, you low, you're low social influence and you feel rejected and you're one of the guys that doesn't get any influence. If you succeed, then you get audience capture and you become the instrument for attention, which splits your persona from your core self. Yep. And now you're successful, but you're a fucking, you don't know who the hell you are and you don't, can't really get in touch with yourself because you're basically an instrument for attention gathering across the persona, not a coherent entity of a persona and ego and an I mean, experiential so. self in awareness of the real. Okay. Yes. So it breaks both systems. You either lose or you break the system and drop it into instrumental persona control which also is alienating. So that, that's why that's why I think we're facing a lot of the feeling of emptiness. And what mm -hmm. is emptiness? This is this fragmentation. You're not a coherent, integrated entity. You're just feeling, even if you're successful, you're the, the it's empty calories of love. You know, these are empty calories Boy. of love. And, and then you're like, ah, oh, what do I do with it? So anyway, to me, the structure of reinforcement, you think about how different that is from a hunter-gatherer society, where everybody's playing a particular kind of role as their individual across all the dialogues that they have across time, and everybody mm -hmm. sees everybody's arc and they're connected in a particular kind of way. This this completely fractures all of that, and it affords, yeah. I think, a, a deepening potential for a chaotic psyche matrix inside that's trying to navigate this. And we're we're not shining the light with any clarity as to why this is actually going on. Well, I mean, that's the endeavor of this conversation is to be able to shine that light, right? Because I think this coming back to the the anecdote that's carrying us through like a ship through this storm is that once that identity becomes cemented, the entire cascade that you had just so eloquently described becomes validated for at least that bloody three years that we're in school, except that now it's going to get slightly worse because then that whole framing around the institution um, of performance practice in the form of a conservatory kind of model is, and this is primarily why I left uh, drama school, is that I, I'm very famous for saying this now, I didn't want to be hung on a meat hook for agents to come and pick it, grab at me. You know, a lot of what I wanted to do um, was come back to my home country and work here, mm. you know, so I didn't have that I had that degree of separation from, you know, oh, I want to be like a big actor in the UK mm -hmm. and whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to separate from that a little bit more mm -hmm. and then say, okay, what is that distance actually affording me? And I've watched, you know, kind of my classmates and people who are in the same cohort after they graduated, having to struggle and rebuild their identities mm -hmm. um, coming out of that, mm -hmm. you know, because being the attention grabbing or I suppose having to utilize oneself instrumentally mm -hmm. in that way wasn't serving anymore. So mm. there had to be 
some new framework, which a lot of them, you know, went into like a period of time where it's like, I really got to discover myself. I really got mm-hmm. to find out what, mm-hmm. um, who I am right now. Mm-hmm. COVID helped to a certain mm-hmm. degree, mm-hmm. right? But the consistency at which I've seen my colleagues having to do that, some of them really um, couldn't make it, um, you know, for for whatsoever reason. Um, mm-hmm. Some of them are still trying and some of them succeeded. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, all actors go through this. I, I don't want to make a general statement here. Sure. Mm-hmm. What I am saying is that there is a certain risk and occupational hazard, mm-hmm. let's put it that way, which increases now more than ever mm-hmm. the possibility of that happening, mm-hmm. you know, and that's sure. dangerous. So what that little distance, uh, sorry, Greg, but I think this is, this. I want to bring us to the next milestone um, in this anecdote is that when I finished my first year and I came back to start my second, mm-hmm. it was of absolute importance for me that I started my own lab uh, in the school. I'm paying for it, might as well use the resources. Mm-hmm. So I generated my own lab by renting out a space okay. uh, from the school. It was mm-hmm. available to us. And then I would invite people who are not actors mm. to come in and train. Mm. But we would train in a way that um, was as much as possible self-defined towards finding what is common in our huh. experience. Wow. I needed to hear that outside conservatoire voice, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I had like, a, I had a Romanian rock musician. I had a Chinese biologist you know, ah. in, my, in my crew whatsoever. <laughs> And we would look at exercises from books or we would have questions um, Mm -hmm. and we would just start improvising and exploring, not improvisational exercises. We were trying to improvise processes Mm -hmm. that got us towards something that we could coalesce around and identify as like, this is something interesting. This is something special. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling something different here. Mm -hmm. And so that has been the foundational step Mm -hmm. for my entire research since 2016 until now, wow. which is much more of a gestalt approach yeah. around why does this interest you? What is mm. this realness that you're finding? Mm. And how are you adjusting to develop means of finding coherence in the world? Hmm. Which for me is kind of where performance really can potentially open up um, some a lot of avenues for self-knowledge and self-discovery. Totally. Yes. Um this is, uh, I'll make a little bridge here, but then we can come back, mm. you know. Um, so one of the things that we want to do in psychotherapy, okay, is we want to first, we want to align often with this stuck, uh, sort of parasitically driven frame into the world and, and honor that, uh, recognize sort of the trauma history and relationship to that. Um, but one of the great things I believe that psychotherapy affords us is a kind of epistemic flexibility if it's done well. Okay. Mm. So what you want to be able to recognize, one of the core things you want to be able to recognize in the world is the multiplicity of perspectives okay, uh, that one can take with integrity um, that open up all sorts of different potentialities uh, as you take them. Okay? Mm. Uh, in ACT, <laughs> thing called ACT, uh, acceptance yeah. and commitment therapy, um, this issue of the difference between sort of a fused cognitive state where I and the world and, this, and are actually, this is the way it has to be, and I hate that it's this way, and I have to try to fix it, and it has to be another way, um, and anything else is really just sort of blocked out of the relevance frame automatically. Mm. One of the things you want to do, you want to diffuse the self. You want to place the self in context. Um, you want to shine the light on the subtext of the text in relation. You want to afford different transtextual relations to it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And to me, and I never, and I certainly saw this some in psychodrama. Okay. So what psychodrama is doing is enabling individuals to deliberately occupy a different perspectival framing, right? That's your task. Okay. So now instead of being the avoidant scary, you know, kid who's terrified about this, okay, play the bully, you know? Okay. So now play the bully. And it's amazing that though, that many people, most people, uh, and I think we can look to people like Lev Gygotsky uh, and more recently Tom, Michael Tomasello and confuse that with John's work in the influence makers that actually we humans, we have this unbelievable capacity to put on a new perspective, to put on a salience landscaping and inhabit that from a perspectival and participatory way. Actually, that is how 
we get our primate cells get socialized. We get socialized through justification, but we get socialized through the vicarious learning structures and the inhabiting of shared attention and intentional space. And in order to do that, we have all sorts of different kinds of flexibility. So what psychodrama started to do was to, to enable that and bridge it between psychotherapy. And what I think you're doing <laughs> is you're laying that out in a way that's just mind blowing. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, just the, that, that, that's what I'm like, holy shit, that's really damn cool. <laughs> Thank you, but like you've embodied that uh, in the past three minutes better than I could have explained it. So like, okay, let's let's zoom out, right? Talk about <laughs> epistemic uh, flexibility, but let's zoom out. So look, when we're, we're both aware of the context in which we're currently conversing, right? Which is that this is being recorded, this episode you're talking with Greg, whatsoever. So that context is very set and is very contained. And I don't know if you noticed this, but like, you were you were speaking on one side, and then when you turn to reference me, you spoke to the other side. So there is an embodied sense of that context being brought in, you know, and it changes your behavior. Uh -huh. There is realistically no nothing on your table that's like I'm not sitting on your table, right? <laughs> so so there isn't a, really an imminent reason to do that, but. You notice how I'm pointing at an awareness of how that thing is going to be perceived as an observer. So that's the context in which it sits, right? And then beneath that is the text. And so is the text, the, the, the actual propositional things that you are talking about that you just had spoken about, right? Which needs to be remain um, true in that sense. And then beneath that is the Gregness of it, the subtext, right? To what degree are you compat are you passionate about it to what degree uh -huh. does it frustrate you and there's your uh -huh. personal interpretation of that uh -huh. now i think it's fair to say that our hope is that this conversation were it to really catch fire uh -huh. cuts through that that contextual subtextual textual triangle and becomes transtextual which is where I don't mean to throw out jargon on, on everybody, mm -hmm. but like, mm -hmm. this is something that um, Greg and I have been developing uh, in concert with each other. See what I've just mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. And so that transtextual framing is where whoever is listening to this, maybe, you know, it hits particular relevance for them. Maybe you are, you know, just starting out drama school and you're not quite sure where you're at or you've hit something like this this uh, incident in the anecdote that I've just spoken about maybe this is particularly relevant for you and now what you're experiencing hopefully is this transtextual thing that Greg and I are trying to bring into relevance with you exactly, exactly. you know exactly and, yeah. yeah now actually we can just pause there okay because actually I this is to me, uh, this is a threading concept, okay? This is sort of a very profound threading concept. Uh, so in, I, in you talk, uh, the, the core epistemology, I don't talk about it all that much, but it's called I-quad monism, I-quad aspect monism, okay? Monism means, you know, we're focused on the endonatural one world. God only knows what's on the outside of that, but let's try to get our natural philosophy and right relation in a conciliant way, okay? And at the very least, what it says is that you absolutely need four different epistemological lenses. Okay. Um, there is, there's the, whatever we're going to try to decide, whatever the truth is of that we're going to be observing, that we'll call the text. Okay. And we'll call propositional truth claims as sort of the text that say science is going to try to grab and align with the world. So these are, that's one thing. Underneath that is the felt sense, the subjective felt sense of an individual's relationship to that text, okay? There's the intersubjective context, which actually we all got to get together and justify why we're going to bring and create this frame in relationship to it. So we have this text, which hopefully represents the objective correspondence, if we apply this to our scientific. There's an intersubjective justificatory context mm -hmm. that's framing this. There's each of our subtexts, and then we can, on a nod to John Verveke, we can then say, well, what's a transjective view of this across context and time and development, okay? And it is that through line, okay, that John points to as, hey, objective, subjective, being your inner subjective, that's not enough. We need the transjective. Well, the transtextual, right? Yeah. That transtextual 
So for folks that sort of know John's work and know and know you talk and now know you in relation, it's like, oh wow, we can actually jump that epistemological framing and place it here in the performance context, <laughs> you know, and be like, oh wow, that actually opens up a huge number of different uh, lenses and conciliating framings potentially uh, between a wide variety of different domains. So that's really cool. I love that you've reflected that so well. Um, and also I was wanting to always pose this question to you for weeks now, uh, since we brought up this thing, but do you reckon that we could actually map the text to the true, the context to the good and the subtext to the beautiful? That's right. Yep. Um, <laughs> so the, you know, what the great, to me, the great, there are, there are a set of fundamentally great problems. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's what the, the, tra the transcendentals are great justificatory problems. Okay. Uh, and the great justificatory problems are like, all right, what? Okay. So when we get to propositions, all right, when we get to propositions, there are three immediate problems that emerge. All right. Mm -hmm. According to. So basically, it's a positive space. So there are the antelope. And now propositions have positive corresponding truth claims. And ultimately, then, this is the ground of truth. And at least where we are in relationship to science, science with its correspondent truth claim is our basic best epistemic modeling for getting the most accurate objective frame. And it's a whole method that takes your subjective impression and position and our intersubjective context and tries to obliterate that. I call it factor out the knower. And what I mean by that is factor out, it's cross-contextual, it's irrespective of subject, it's the truth claim that's going to grant us. And the entire scientific method is about Xing out the personal and Xing out the larger context, okay? So you can then argue that science connects to the question of what is true, at least whereby mm -hmm. what is true defines by what is the true statements that correspond with the most tightness to reality in a basic correspondent principle of truth. So we can make that kind of connection, right? And thus, mm -hmm. therefore, we have the connection of what is true as one of the great transcendentals and science pointing to that, okay? We then have well, what ought to, the, according, once we start talking propositions, we're drawing our attention together, okay? Mm -hmm. And we are, as a very social species, we are collectively aligned, okay? We have to coordinate ourselves. So to coordinate ourselves, the social problem basically turns into, well, what is the good? What ought to we do as a group? And then in order to answer that question, you have to have shared meta values, okay, that specify for us moving forward, this state is better than that state. And we then have to have collective mythos and ethos, justificatory structures that embody stories of the good and ethical decision-making for the collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. So the context is going to say, well, we're going to evaluate the utility of these truth claims. This is all postmodern thing. Well, you're going to fuck it. Everything's going to be contextually dependent. So we have to focus on the context and inevitably, inherently, sociolinguistically, contextually historical. Right, because it depends on what American culture people get together, and they're like, oh, that's good, and that's mythically true, and that's going to frame the kinds of questions that we ask. So the good for them, and then what is personally real and relevant? What aligns my own dignity with my own subjective aesthetic? Why am I gripped by this as being beautiful? Right, yeah. this is just speaks to me. And I did the whole radical mathematical humanistic equation. There's a thing that you talk where it's like I actually put some numbers together. And my subjective experience of being given the journey that it took me to see what those numbers represent feels the beauty of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. It feels the beauty of that. That speaks to my unique aesthetic. All right. So, what we can say is the subtextual pathic feeling of the world then gives rise to well, what is beautiful and why does the subject grip beauty in a particular way? What actually is this correspondence? Science helps us. What is this contextualized structure of justification? And ultimately, mm -hmm. I think you can get a good, true, beautiful um, uh, framing from those kinds of interrelations. You have very eloquently articulated what, <laughs> in scientific language, funnily enough, what makes art feel so artistic. Mm. You know? And in a way, is really trying to say, okay, well, the thing that you're feeling is beautiful in and of itself. And so, okay, 
Now, let me just offer the art side of this of okay. this thing, okay? Because at least insofar as performance is concerned, or let's let's talk about just your bog standard theater, mm -hmm. okay? Is that the context is set, mm -hmm. it doesn't change. Right. If it changed every single night, we'd have difficulties getting good reviews. Right. Yeah. So it's it's so consistent. In other words, it is deliberately introducing invariance. Mm -hmm. So then we can remove the context right. from the equation. Right. Now, what that does that's different from science is that it's not trying to arrive necessarily at the truth. Mm -mm. It's trying to like arrive instead at that subtextual layer yep. first. Totally. And it's saying, okay, great. So let's create some affect within right. the collective. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that affect because let's face it, if it's grounded with a narrative structure, the data on this is very clear. Everybody's physiology gets aligned. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of responding to it physiologically on more or less the same level. How it manifests mm -hmm. is a bloody different thing. Mm -hmm. But something is happening to us as a collective. We know this yep. through music as well. Oh, of course. Okay? So now the truth in that sense, if you're playing you know, something mm -hmm. like Hamlet at the Barbican Theatre, that's not going to change very much, yeah. right? So we can kind of remove that from the mm -hmm. equation a little mm -hmm. bit. Yep. But then here's what happens after the show, and this is mm -hmm. my big, um, the proposal that I'm working on of Gnostic spectatorship, mm -hmm. is that we want to get to the place, I think, now more so than ever, where artists are equipped with the skills. And I don't just mean like, you know, performance skills. I'm talking about relational skills mm -hmm. to be able to inspire mm -hmm. Gnosticism in an audience, wow. mm -hmm. you know, so that it's not just, hey, come in, see the show. It starts at eight, it ends at 10, and then mm -hmm. we'll meet you at the bar. Mm -hmm. It's that I want to meet you at the bar to get an understanding of like what really struck you there. You know, how did that point you towards something that is happening in row E seat 14 that I wasn't aware of because I was upstage left. Totally. You know? And totally. I feel like this is really where the artist's work is. Yep. It's not Absolutely. in an in an echo chamber of concepts and, and ideas and playing yep. with structure, you know, feeding into some kind totally. of agenda to get them grants. Yep. It's saying like, okay, I'm going to do this thing. It can be with no bloody money at all. And, yeah. you know, um, Augusto Boal's work is, is fantastic for this, mm -hmm. right? Things like forum theater, you know, uh, the whole theater of the oppressed genre is trying to engage in this, the power of Gnostic spectatorship yep. so that the audience comes out of that encounter yep. at a much higher order than they were. And yes. I would argue that's the reason why um, the ancient Greeks had a chorus, as a representative mm. of mm. quite a lot of the contextual dimension, mm -hmm. which to be fair, you know, it wasn't nearly as, as chaotic and disjointed as, and pluralistic as our society is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I would feel that, hey man, there's a reason to bring that back. Yeah, And totally. if the chorus can exist in an individual artist, mm. you know, enough for them with enough epistemological humility to bring that out, you know, with vulnerability and in good faith to engage with a collective voice. Mm -hmm. Oh, then we might get at genuine like dialogue mm -hmm. between the fictional context representing some microcosm of uh, humanity through an individual or, or a small group of individuals and the actual real collective that is facing something. Right. Damn! I cannot get not fired up when I'm talking to you, Greg. Like, fucking <laughs> consistently, yes. Well, um, I may not get the exact quote right, but but pretty much uh, in Edward Wilson and and Stephen Jay Gould, who, if you know any of the history, Stephen Jay Gould and Edward Wilson, both at Harvard, criticized each other. But they, but they agreed in conciliance. Mm -hmm. The greatest enterprise of the human mind has always been the attempted linkage of the sciences and humanities in a conciliant framework. That is that that's that is their that's their shared contextual understanding of conciliance. And I gotta tell you, I don't know that this feels pretty fucking conciliant in relationship to the arts and the sciences. <laughs> in, in that regard, my friend, uh, that's a fucking beautiful thing. 
I mean, it does feel very, very close. Like, and and to be sitting at the intersection of this, especially also because time has brought us, like, not just the time that we spent together, mm-hmm. but generally on our culture, right? Bringing that that together for me feels interesting. Twenty twenty two um has been laced with, I think, quite personally, I feel quite poignant metamodern work. Mm-hmm. You know, things like um. Uh, everything everywhere all at once mm-hmm. um 3000 years of longing is a wonderful uh mythical storytelling you know there are so many wonderful pieces of work that are starting to reflect a mm. change in the way that the collective is justifying itself and mm. its current issue you know and the fact that there are artists who are willing to do that now is okay mm. great uh but i think that is also prime time for us as artists to really work with scientists as you know I, i'm sure that you've articulated this as well in your new book mm-hmm. uh please get it a new synthesis <laughs> uh i don't need to plug you on your own channel hey, man. man thanks man that's good <laughs> hey i only got three reviews out there two five star and a one star review where a guy's like this is too expensive i didn't buy it but i'm giving one star anyway so go out there and buy it we we're up you know we're not going to change the reward with three reviews so i'll take the plug <laughs> especially if one of them, a third of them is a one from somebody who didn't read it. It's a tough world out there to be an instrumental influencer, I'm learning. <laughs> you want to start an Instagram channel, Greg? I need, a, I need an Instagram. Man. We need to release this thing somehow. I've been pent up in my little rabbit hole for long enough, and I don't know how to do that, but maybe you performers can help me out. <laughs> All right, let's, let's see. Let's see who's, hmm. who's keyed into it. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. So I'm going to try and like, I'm gonna try and realign to this. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, this this sense of like, okay, so in, in the interest of trying to step into the space that you know the people like you and and John are working in, you know, I, I've been trying to articulate uh, what could be a potential counteractive dynamical system um, that is going to help to level out the occupational hazard and mitigate the the dangers of performance, mm-hmm. you know, as a potentially parasitic process inducing Uh art form Uh you know um and so this is where i started to develop this thing called sapiential processing which basically i mean it's fancy terminology for how does a wise brain work Uh you know and so i've been having conversations uh with some with some colleagues as well uh john notwithstanding you know he we have an episode uh, of voices that's coming out where i explain sapiential processing um and if you're interested by all means uh please head over to john's channel i think i explain it in much greater depth there we've gone through it but where uh, the sapiential processing ends up i think is something for me uh is kind of interesting but i feel also requires a good deal of healthy skepticism Uh and scientific scrutiny Uh and it culminates on this idea of an embodied multi-perspectival situational awareness which you had Uh alluded to earlier Uh Uh and where i'm going to take that slightly further is perhaps to this notion of the non-duality and i was having conversation with uh, a friend of mine who is also a facilitator around this that the non-dual proposal here uh, insofar as sapiential processing is concerned, is that the awareness of one's fluency to adopt multiple identities in a context-sensitive manner mm-hmm. that leads to optimal processing, mm-hmm. just awareness of that mm-hmm. is in itself the non-duality. One doesn't mm-hmm. have to be me versus you. Mm-hmm. I can be any measure Uh of perspectives, Uh I can switch between them, Uh I can have them all around. Uh And that in itself allows me to have the epistemic flexibility Uh to not get caged into a single identity that might be neurotic and parasitic. Tear it apart. No, I mean, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, And I I think think that the, uh, I'm reminded of my friend, uh, Rob Scott, who's going to be presenting uh, on Friday, uh, he he had a really fascinating journey. Had a really tough abuse history. Um, mm. Lived on the street for a long time. Was homeless, drug addicted, etc. Fascinating, um, and ultimately has a t- couple of awakenings. Um, and now is a deep, philosophically informed, autodidactic life coach. 
um, mm -hmm. slash philosopher, really. He's a deep and profound philosopher. And here's how he puts it. He's made a fundamental shift, okay, and then does adaptive identity shifting, okay? So, nice. so what it, basically, what was his fundamental shift? Ultimately, you could very closely tie uh, the fundamental shift to the capacity to invest in being the multi-perspectival position. I mean, uh, that's exactly what he shifts out of the one position and shifts into the network many mm -hmm. as one, okay, and lives across of that and then adaptively drops into particular identities and thus creates a constructive opponent process between a multi-perspectival shifting structure that feels at one with both is and ought across a multi and then lives in the world and in a contextual identity and feels the network, the coherent integrated network of that. Uh, and when I learned the fundamental shift and I, I embodied that, I expanded aspects of you talk in a particular kind of way. I now toggle between self and awareness. Awareness is a particular pathway and a multi-perspectival awareness pathway networked, a network multi-perspectival awareness. That's a real transpersonal, you know, spiritual kind of uh, perspective. Um, that's why I'm, I'm thinking, man, you, you really, and with the whole idea that you get there through performance, it's just super freaking cool. And there is absolutely a lot of coherent resonance here, man. It's a really, really powerful thing. Oh, that lands deep because I always felt like, you know, oh, performance is more than just, you know, going on stage or going on camera and doing the thing. It feels to me now that it's a real crucible for complexification, not just of the psyche, but of course, when you complexify psyches, they ripple out into the culture. Exactly. And so the idea here is that, you know, there is some kind of... Let, let's double line, click on the right? word complexify, because there's just so people right. understand what that term means, okay? Because this is actually what our co culture needs to do right now. So complexity, complexification has these other components. So John is very clear on this. Uh, Tyler Vokes called combo genesis. It's a really cool. Anyway, what complexification is, is, is it's the differentiation and integration with a coherent through line, okay, as it grows, okay? And so now the system, and this I know you know, but in terms of for people that are there, so when we talk about, hey, we have to figure out how to, what, what is the emergent complexification? Well, it's when parts are splitting, like mm -hmm. as John would say, you are, you know, you start off as a zygote, and look at you now, you're a multiplicity of different cells, okay, but all parts cells with a particular kind of integrated coherent through line. Mm. Indeed, the whole thrust that I, at a sensibility that I'm looking to try to cultivate, I define the metamodern sensibility as a coherent, integrative pluralism, okay? So there's a differentiation across integration that has some kind of coherent through line that affords multi-perspectival shifting, flexibility, but at the same time, constructive opponent process and clarity about an eidetic through line. And that's in, in what I hear you describing, I hear you embodying what I hear the practice and procedure, which by the way, we should be very careful about procedures towards wisdom. And I'm not saying you're saying this, but any procedural structure towards wisdom should immediately brought under close and careful scrutiny. Okay. Anything that tries to make wisdom easy um, or clear uh, should immediately be brought under our, our learned ignorance about the world and the dangers of any kind of procedural structure and what humans will want instrumentally out of shit uh, that then turns basically it's say audience capture or whatever power dynamics would get activated. Anyway, I'm rambling now, but fundamentally, uh, this is why I'm so excited when I learned about the difference between parasitic and sapiential processing and what the core of sapiential processing is and the embodiment that performance affords us in relationships just, and the practices that it enables. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. There are so many things that you have just said that I, I really want to pick up on. One of those things that you, you named it, obviously, obviously in behavioral investment theory, you named it as an investment the investment in the networking of these multitude of perspectives, what um, John and I had uh, articulated in, in one of the episodes as a symphony of sages, mm -hmm. right? Mm. So that these perspectives are functionally speaking to each other, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and able to adaptively assess any situation that comes up in valence. Right. In other words, the system in terms of our, our processing is able to 
selectively regulate what is relevant in the environment uh-huh. um, and to not overlook certain bits of information just yeah. because they might not be immediately uh, available and you know important. So that's one aspect. The other aspect that you had brought up, which I thought was uh, really quite pertinent, is uh, at least you implied this, which is that there is a coherent um, um, through line in a sense that these perspectives are not cancelling each other out. They're not dissociative. You know, in fact, uh, it sounds like it's the opposite that's happening through the functional networking of these different nodes or this uh, and instruments in the symphony. They're actually affording and reinforcing the development of this through line. Right. And so this through line, of course, in your um, architecture of the mind model, where we had talked about having the the different kinds of the different layers of memory, mm-hmm. right? So there's the there's the long term, the sensory motor, there's the working memory, right? And then uh, we had also talked about the autonoetic memory being the through line that links all these things together. Oh. So mm-hmm. what can be self consciously referenced as mm-hmm. being uh, integral to the self, right? Exactly. Yeah. So once we maintain the the through line, then we can say that okay, there is truly adaptive code switching or like or like persona adopting, right? Mm-hmm. In situations that is dynamic and is adaptive and is optimal to each situation without losing kind of the core of what sure. I am. And that's yep. um, Bonnie Roy's wonderful idea of the core self. Mm. Now, here comes the procedure because we can talk about this on a live long day. The question is how the hell do we do that, uh-huh. right? And so where I feel um, performance training or performance practice is really powerful in doing that is that because the the demands of the art form, right? So there is a sense of normative governance uh, in order to do the task well, uh-huh. right? one has to be aware not just of the subjective, Mm -hmm. but also what is being observed, Mm -hmm. right? What needs to be hit on a technical level, whether it's Mm -hmm. a dance move or it's a light or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there is this dynamic interplay that's occurring, you know, Mm -hmm. between the internal and the external world, Mm -hmm. which necessitates that the training should facilitate the balancing of these two Mm -hmm. plates, you know? Right. Uh So this is where I kind of um, coalesce around John's uh, uh, ritual proposal. Like when we talk about what is what is ritual, I I argue that a core part of ritual from an an inactive standpoint Uh right, to Uh invoke the four Uh E's is that we're not just running on feeling. If I feel the thing I do. No, because then, you know, as um, uh, Nikolai Demidov, who is the first uh, uh, trainer, first director of the Moscow Art Theatre, who taught Uh Stanislavski's method. Uh, actually said you fall into a motor storm Mm. and the idea being that if a pigeon flies into your room it doesn't go like oh sorry greg like (laughs) i'm not supposed to be here where's the window again all right i'll I'll see you another day sorry mate sorry to intrude please get back Uh to your meeting it it loses its shit and it flies around until it either a dies or b accidentally finds the exit Uh and that's a complete collapsing of your entire rational faculty if you fall into a motor storm Uh right So where I find uh, this particularly important is that in the enactment of some kind of procedural act, Mm -hmm. let's say, uh, okay, let's just limit it to performance first, okay? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be performing this particular choreography or blocking, Mm -hmm. where is my attention? Mm. It can't just be on, oh, am I doing this thing well? Mm -hmm. You don't know if you're doing it well. (laughs) Mm. and only the director will tell you so don't bother Mm. right it's just am i doing the thing okay so i do the thing as best i can right to what i know is self laid out for me no problem now that's one eye the other eye is how is this affecting my experience of the world Mm. if i'm going to be saying to be or not to be Mm -hmm. that is the question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the dot 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 I can't be obsessed with, am I saying to be or oh, uh, combinatorial explosion? <laughs> bloody hell. No, I know the lines, mm-hmm. right? What the attention is on is, mm, is this getting me into some state of being that's closer to Hamlet, that's closer to what we as colleagues working in the field are trying right. to create, 
You know, what's our vision of this character? How is that working? Right. Now, if we can leverage, you know, uh, some of the intersubjectivity practices like distributed cognition uh -huh. to generate, imagine like circling Hamlet, right? right? Uh -huh. It's like, then we can sit down as a team and uh -huh. say, wow, how do we want the experience of this person to be when we open the show? Uh -huh. Now, this person who is, uh, and we try this sometimes where it's like, you know, we'll get a, a, an actor to play the character. They'll do some Lexio Divina or they'll do some mm -hmm. Actio Divina. Okay. And then we'll circle them as, as the character. Mm. And then we're going to reflect back how interacting with this character makes us feel. Well, something is interesting in a sense that it's concretizing their worldview. Mm -hmm. So the actor brain that's sitting inside the character is getting a mm -hmm. clearer picture, mm -hmm. not just of how I feel I am, but how, how I feel I am is affecting everybody else. Totally. That's a ritual. Mm. Now this person has normative governance. Mm. Now this person can properly go like, okay, if this state is manifesting itself in this way, I can also check it in concert with my colleagues to go, right. is it affecting you in that way? If everybody in the world had the ability to go, am I being a dick when I say <laughs> this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> then you know and people are going yeah you are kind of being a dick mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. no you're not and we love you for mm -hmm. it you know mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. ah okay our ability to cohere with the world starts to become i think a little bit more high resolution totally yeah. totally that which was a is a pretty off. no a pretty valuable thing the ability to cohere to the world with high resolution huh <laughs> we should do more of that <laughs> What do you think that would do to our culture if we if if let's say if let's say everybody was an actor, right? Mm -hmm. or, or at least everybody was a trained actor in this sense, uh, this ritual sense, what do you think uh, what's your projection of what will happen to the to our culture and our world? Um I mean that's a that's a wonderful question. My my hope, here I'll give you my hopeful answer. <laughs> you yeah. know, okay. Normative governance, uh, let's go. Uh, no, the, right. The hopeful answer um is very actually very similar to what you talk is trying to do. Okay. Um, what do you talk is trying to do is be very self-conscious. Okay. Uh, it's, it's cultivating a particular kind of meta-conscious awareness of the intersubjective context, scientific truth and relation, the subjective experience of being and the implications across time. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and what this feels like is, is the process by which individuals can hone that framing. There's a process by which individuals can now inhabit different roles, right? The, the capacity to inhabit roles with, if, if the cultural context affords a healthy metacognitive uh, enabling of that, that allows for the diversity of perspectives within the container, then you basically enable a kind of elevated consciousness to me, mm. okay? Mm. A, a recognition that you're in this particular place that you're dropping, to use some of uh, Rob's frame, that you're dropping into identity. But at the mm. same time, when necessary, you can coherently create a fundamental shift into the multi-perspectival symphony of sage perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And then the idea, what would it be like if when people collide in their identities, both of them stop <laughs> and recognize that my parasitic process is driving my roll car into yours and I just T-boned your roll car, right? Okay, you know? And then instead of you're a, you, the essence of you is a fucking asshole, you know, because your car's in the wrong fucking place and that hurt me. And the other was, you drove in front of me, you idiot, you know? And now all of a sudden you have my egoic investment in my identity hitting and when that thing sparks then all of a sudden you're trapped in a vicious cycle of hostility because now i need to destroy uh if i take a hostile frame you either blame self or blame other to try to create identity you know uh realignment basically mm. and that's the mm. that's the default the justificatory default is i am my identity and if something bad happens either i'm to blame or you're to blame and i'm going to justify that narrative and control it accordingly but you're actually, wait a minute, you, that identity represents a part that you have inhabited, <laughs> and there's a multiplicity mm -hmm. of potential identities that you now understand in relation. If two people all of a sudden pop into the actual accident, and then, in fact, I just had an accident not too long ago, you know, um, 
and then there was my primate freaked out self. Uh, mm-hmm. And actually, I, I I did. I I jumped in front. I didn't see somebody. Jumped in front. Got got T bone. Totally my fault. And with to a nun, <laughs> okay, with a nun. She was a nun. It was born, and and it was super fascinating because my entire primate self is like, oh my god, you know, just the, right. the cascade of now broken behavioral investment paths. I'm going to go pick somebody up at the airport. Now I can't do that. Now I'll do this. So I got to call the cops. What's going on? Is this woman hurt? That's the first thing. The our airbag went off. This is serious enough. Mm-hmm. The car need to be towed away. And the, the flood, okay, but thankfully in relationship to this, it's also somehow, well, but through training and awareness, I can just drop in and basically, huh, you know? And, and we spent the time waiting for the police talking about the concept of God. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and, and and structured our relationship to the good. You know, and she she had a good. Word. She's like, "Do you believe in God?" I said, "I believe in the good." She's like, "Do you believe in God?" I said, "I believe in the concept of God." She's like, "That's a little wordy," <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, I can appreciate why you would say that." And we and we held, you know, this kind of fine line between is God really loving us or are we, you know, engendering God by loving each other? And we sat in this sort of space. Um, and actually, it was meaningful. She gave me a little Mary signal that I put up on in the monastery here at you talk. OK, oh uh, so there's a that's just what I mean in terms of, uh, you know, I just sort of found myself in that. But what would it be like? Right. If, if people when they bumped each other and crashed into each other instead yeah. of doubling down on their identities and either I was a horrible person for doing that or you're a complete asshole. And we are now fused parasitically with those things. You drop outside of that and. That is an important role. That's an extension of myself, granted. And it's also that I'm a multiplicity of different perspectives and we can engender a multiplicity of different perspectives. Well, you do the fractal equation on that and I think the world will be better. <laughs> so, firstly, are you okay? Like, I, yeah, no, yeah, no, nobody was hurt. Not hurt. Nobody was uh, hurt. Uh, later today, okay. I'm taking my car down to get it uh, to get it fixed. But my car was still drivable, and nobody was hurt. Obviously, if somebody was hurt, I would not be laughing about that. But yeah. Okay, so there is something really profound and poetic about the story of Greg <laughs> keyboned by a nun, um, <laughs> because in that moment, right, it was really. I, I'm going to put it in a scene at some point, but like. What's really powerful about that um, particular anecdote is that there is there is the coming out of the car and the capacity to recognize that I'm not going to yell and curse at a nun, you know? And so, like, there is something here uh, implicit in this idea of having these metacognitive faculties honed to such uh, acute level of resolution is that the, the metacognitive system is in and of itself, I would say responsible for self-optimizing, which includes recognizing where it's fucked up, you know? And that's very difficult to do on a collective cultural level because it's one thing to be able to like feel really pissed off after you just got T-boned, go like, what the fuck? And then you open the door and go like, ah, sister, uh, so, you know, it's one thing to be able to do that on an individual level, but I think it's a completely different ballpark when we're trying to assess culturally what is occurring with equal frequency, with equal resolution, right? And to say, all right, there is a problem here and that thing is not really working. And I need to talk to other people who might be able to give me clearer understanding of what the problem actually is but at the same time, ameliorate the biases and not form an echo chamber. Now, when you have brought up earlier this point about being very careful about somebody who is unilaterally declaring themselves as a guru, then I would actually say that the, how do I say this, readiness to capitulate to a unitary totalitarian authority um, is an injunction towards the convenience of not having to deal with the complexity of negotiating a collective consensus right. around problem formulation. That is by far the most coherent sentence I have said in the past week. Um, <laughs> and important, by the way, you know, we can, we can ask just that thing. And basically like, that's an, a, a profound implication 
right? Uh, of what it is uh, of, of if we're if we're trying to steer our way through the wisdom famine to use John's term into the kinds of structures, one of the things we can be clear about are the properties and processes that it's going to engender. And you just articulated mm. that brilliantly. But you know, here's the question, right? It's like if it's going to be so bloody difficult to negotiate, they're always going to be pulled by the convenience of capitulation, then there I think it's fair to say la, that there should be some steps and some scaffolds in place to develop the resilience to engage with um, collective group conversations while mitigating bias. <clears throat> but how do we motivate people towards developing that skill set? Because clearly it's valuable. I think the science behind that, the, the data is very clear that it's absolutely valuable. It helps ameliorate the mental, the mental health crisis. You know, we see drops in general anxiety. We see drops in depression. We see, you know, much more uh, evidence of cognitive agency, right? But still, this question of, fuck, is really existentially difficult to want to bring yourself to do that. How? How can we um, appeal the masses to developing a skill set that can actually be rather fun mm -hmm. to do um, and enjoyable and also very life giving? So, oh. I, I think it's a great question. I think it's a, and and maybe we'll be, start to bring ourselves to a close in relationship mm -hmm. to it because uh, maybe we'll you'll come back and you can answer this for us. <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, I uh, so. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I need to say, this is interesting, just along the lines of embodying this, I jumped out in front of a nun. That was totally my fault, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I did not see her. Um, and I remembered, it was interesting, I remember the insurance company, basically, at some point, somebody told me, you're never supposed to admit fault, you know? I was like, fuck that, I screwed this up, you know? Um, so I did, I told the cops, I got my little citation up here that I need to pay. Right. I mean, it wouldn't have been confusing. Um, I totally screwed it up. But the issue is, how do we hold that? Right. I mean, because to me, there, there's this. Other, how do we hold blame self, blame other? as just one example. And there's the intrapsychic, relational and sociocultural context for this. Right. Um, and of course, this issue, mm. I think all of us that are sitting somewhat on the sidelines, say, of the culture wars okay, and watching, at least in the United States, a, a complete unraveling of a political context, a shared political context that is focused on governance of the people, by the people, for the people, and instead is on a fucking horrific, like a super nasty, hostile divorce blame game. You know, the entire structure mm. is to commit to the right identity versus the wrong identity and play a zero sum game of victory and losses. You know, um, yeah. and, and now you're going to kind of create your whole justification is I didn't do it. I don't know whatever happened when you jumped out in front of them because you're distracted or whatever reason that I, you know, I got a good driving record, but I didn't see that. When do you now you create a context when you're in this kind of context? Don't say anything, you know, you know don't say that, you, you know, because the legislative, the competitive, the instrumental, the, the whole thing is like, well, we got to protect. And, and it then basically by protecting, by splitting, by grading polarization, you now by definition are investing in the bias. You're investing in the bias yes. away from the real into the justify, instrumentally justifiable. Okay? And that then is where the power structure. So what we, I think, are advocating for is the proper alignment of goodness, truth, and beauty, ultimately. It's the proper yeah. alignment uh, of, of what, it, what kind of context can hold the complexity from a multi-perspectival way and what kind of socialization, you know? Now, how to do that from where we are, that you can come back and answer next time. Uh, but for now, to me, the issue is to, you know, uh, as, a, as a psychologist and a theorist, problem framing, and I think John and I agree on this, problem framing is absolutely crucial. And to get a grip on a problem from many different perspectives that has a through line of congruence, uh, that, that affords a particular kind of, uh, hopeful validity, and that's what I'm experiencing in relationship to our conversation. Oh, this is, I think, uh, I would love to have more conversations with you. I'm sure we will, definitely, right? Uh, at least in private. And 
I have to say that the time that I've spent with you thus far and your work, even before I met you, has been incredibly influential and responsible for me being able to show up in the way that I'm able to show up today. So uh, thank you on behalf of you. Uh, <laughs> Well, thank you to do friend. this <laughs> yeah and yeah. Uh, i'm so blessed to have you in my life thank you brother oh man it's been great it's been lovely and i'm really seeing a consilient bridge with the science of the humanities now so thank you so much this is so great all right Cheers, take brother. care <laughs>